on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This the people party one, two, three, and a place to be. Party people, you're now rocking with the BKMC, Talib Kweli. How y'all doing? What's up? This is the world's best podcast, People's Party. Shout out to my lovely and talented partner and co-host, the wonderful Jasmine Lee in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? Talib, I'm feeling great. It's because good to see you. It's good to see you too. And pretty soon, I'll be able to see you out of the country. Because you got your passport. Yes. You are an international woman of mystery. That's why you've changed your hair. Is that what it is? That's exactly why you got it. <laughs> I, I call it Ricky. <laughs> You're like a spy. <laughs> you look like a, an international spy. Well, I'm honored to have you as a new member of my family. Um, and, you know, sometimes in life you can choose your family. And other times in life you're born with family that you can't choose. Today's guest is my actual family. <laughs> This is a man that I grew up with. This is a man that is my actual blood family. Today's guest is a legal scholar. He is a professor of law at Columbia University. He is a co-chair of Facebook's Oversight Board. He is the author of the tremendously acclaimed book, How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. In that book, he writes something that resonated with me. He said, rights are the commandments of our civic religion. He is a vital mind in the culture. He is wise on matters large and small with regards to how Americans interact with the legal system. He is my actual brother, metaphysically, spiritually, in many ways, philosophically. And although we have disagreed on certain things, we agree on most things. He's my actual real life brother by blood. This is going to be my favorite People's Party episode ever. Party people, give it up for Jamal Green in the building. What's up, Jamal? How you doing? You're stuck with me. I'm stuck with you. <laughs> I'm stuck with you. How you doing, man? I'm all right. Good to see you. It's good to see you. You're bringing me a real New York vibe. I'm glad you show me uh, the have this whole background of your apartment going yeah, on. Yeah, you got back. a little landscape there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in. I'm unfortunately in a <laughs> hotel room, alone in a hotel room. Oh, uh, but Sounds I'm doing so okay. sad. <laughs> <laughs> I got my, I got my friends and my family with me. I'm I'm excited because I don't think that I can sit and do an interview with any of my siblings. So I'm uh -huh. really really excited to see how you guys are going to pull this off. Yeah, you don't know if he can do it either. Yeah, yes, we're about to find we, we out. We'll soon see. Yeah, we're about to find out. <laughs> okay, so um, full disclosure, I have a new book out called Vibrate Higher. Jamal also has a book out me and Jamal to have a book out at the same time in our lives is a very, very incredible thing to me. So I want to dedicate this episode to Brenda and Perry Green, our parents. Oh, wow. They are such tremendously uh, gifted people, warm people, compassionate people. Uh, they did an excellent job with myself and my brother, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and um, maybe they should write a book or do a movie on, on, on how to raise... Uh, authors who write books to have out at the same time. Um, and we're not, we're not just successful. We're successful at what we do. We're the rare exception to the rule, right? Because most people come uh, from the communities that we come from do not achieve this level of success. So right. we have to, we have to honor the fact that we have, have this privilege uh, that most people don't have. We have this academic privilege. We have the privilege of our parents both being in our lives. A lot of people don't have that. Um, Jamal, what special elements do you see from our upbringing that set those wheels in motion? You know, I was actually talking to our mother about this mm -hmm. um, just last weekend and about the fact that they were su they're such open people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they weren't prescriptive. Mm -hmm. They weren't like, here's what you got to do and you got to do it this way and you got to do it. Th they were very much like, be, be you. You know, we're going to make sure that you have a roof over your head. We're going to make sure you get fed. We're going to make sure that you're not exposed to the wrong people. <clears throat> mm. But but your path is all about you mm. yeah. and what your your hopes and your dreams are. And so you end up with two people who actually aren't, you know, we're not that different. We're different in some ways, but we're not mm. that, we're not as different as you would think, mm -hmm. um, given the different things that we do, who are in just totally different spheres, but still doing their thing. and. Yeah. It's not just do you, but also, you know, we got a lot of cultural influences and, and 
it was never about, you know, we are Afrocentric, so you must be Afrocentric. It was never about, mm-hmm. we go to this church, so you must be part of this tradition. We went to a bunch of different churches and, yeah. and not churches, right? And it was never like, we're just going to hang out with white people or just hang out, hang out with black people. Or just gonna, it, was, it was all just like more organic and, and just open. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. What do you think? Um, I absolutely agree, especially with the church part. I wrote about that extensively in my book about how um, when I started questioning religion and you question, you c- come into puberty, you get into high school, you have you start seeing different influences other than your parents and, and your immediate uh, family and your relatives. The fact that our parents were willing to show us different things and to say always to us, never to accept what's on the surface. Always mm-hmm. be willing to go beneath and dig under the surface. Um, I think sometimes that backfired with them, you know, when, when I started arguing with them about things, but it was, <laughs> it was always a, a great thing. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, our father, Perry Green, loved sports in general. He watched a lot of sports, but he had a particular love for baseball. So we grew up playing baseball, and he was a coach of the Little League uh, teams. And um, baseball sports in general, I think, made a much bigger impact in your life than mine. Um, when you went to Harvard University, you wrote about sports. You worked for Sports Illustrated. So what was so appealing to you about the game of baseball? I, th- I Honestly, I don't watch that much baseball anymore. <laughs> oh, that's and, interesting. And I think, I think a lot of it was nostalgia. Mm. And I associate, like you do, I associate baseball with my father mm-hmm. and with my childhood mm-hmm. and with just sitting in the ball- ballpark. And, you know, I, I could say, you know, part of it, I, and I, I think I watch more basketball now, but, it, but it's also mm-hmm. um, when you become a parent and you're, you're, the, the amount of time you have changes, mm-hmm. you know, you want, you want something that starts and ends at a certain time. And then <laughs> it's be- over and you, gotta, you know. <laughs> And where baseball, and that, this is part of the nostalgia of it, right? Is is baseball is about just like sitting back and it's on in the background mm-hmm. while you're doing, you know, doing everything. So it's kind of the music to your, the soundtrack to your, to your life in some ways. Wow, I never thought of it like that. So That's you don't need to be, you know, hard focused on it. Um, but you know, I, I, I think I, I appreciate um, things that start and end a little bit more now. Yeah, I guess it's uh, safe to say that more than any of the major sports in America, baseball is about the experience of the fan in the stands as much as it is about the players. Is, do you think that's true? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's about the culture of the, of the sport and, and yeah. all the statistics and all the, uh, and the history, right? Baseball is one of the only sports where people think the best players played you know, a hundred years ago. <laughs> right. Whereas most of the, most sports is, you know, whoever's good now is, is the best. Right. But that people don't really do that in baseball. And part of it is because it's not really about the game on the field. It's about the culture and the history and the traditions. Um, That's interesting. You say that because if my memory is correct and you could correct me if I'm wrong, um, I got into collecting baseball cards uh, for a couple of years heavy and I got bored with it and I gave my collection of baseball cards to you. Is that accurate? I don't. I don't think that's accurate. That's what um, I remember. <laughs> did, did, of course. That's what, did you know that he got so I, bored with it, and that's why he gifted you baseball cards? So I remember collecting them on my own uh-huh. and <laughs> building my own empire. Of like I had, cards. like I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you well, were. <laughs> you were asking me for cards. That's, well, why, that's gonna, what I remember. <laughs> well, we gonna have to. We gonna have to talk about the rest of that off, off camera. But what I do remember is. Regardless of whether or not I started first or you started first, you absolutely mastered it. And so you, I definitely was asking you for cards because I remember in my memory, I'm like, okay, I was collecting baseball cards, but I wasn't doing it like my brother did it. You know what I'm saying? Like you mastered it. And when you talk about stats and the history of baseball, that was a huge part of it, right? Yeah. No, I was, you know, I was, I was someone who... And I, I could start saying some embarrassing things about myself and about the way I, but I was, I was into numbers and okay, I was yeah. into like mm-hmm. lists. Mm-hmm. Like I would, I would take like matchbox cars and, and smash them to, into each other and then record like which one stayed on top and which one flipped over. I remember they'd, that. Have, they'd have stats yeah, <laughs> and I'd have, you know, papers with that. And so I, 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 had, I was into numbers 
Mm-hmm. So, but, but baseball cards, I think that was a big part of it. It's just, it wasn't the front of the card. It was the back of the card and I could look right. at the numbers. That's interesting. It wasn't the front. It was the back. For me, it was definitely the front. Um, uh, you ended up becoming a sports writer, which I think is very interesting. Um, did this love of numbers and history of baseball and just love of sports in general, like, like that started at that time, right? And led you to wanting to be a sports writer. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was, I like sports. I like baseball, especially, mm-hmm. but I also like to write. <clears throat> and I, mm-hmm. I, I think that's the continuity from, and that's the, that's our, that's our mother, right? You know, our mm-hmm. father and my father's a good writer too, but, but for him, it was you know, being into sports and our mother being into writing and being into literature mm-hmm. and really focusing on, on writing. And so I just, I wanted to, I felt like I wanted to combine those things. And I think the thing that stuck is the writing. So I, I think of myself as a writer mm-hmm. um, now, and that's, that's kind of how I've come to explain what I do because people don't understand what law professors do. Mm-hmm. Um, but we write. And then, you know, sometimes we teach on to get money, but we write. Right. And that's, so if I'm not teaching, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and, and that's, that's just continuous from, from sports writing too. I've heard you talk about your time as Sports Illustrated, talking about the journalism you were doing, being treated like solely as a customer service. Like you said, if you're writing for the eyeballs, you're not really writing from a place of integrity. I might be paraphrasing you a little bit, um, but, um, but can you break that down? What you meant by that? You know, I, I, so I worked, I worked at Sports Illustrated, which, which as you know, when we were growing up was kind of the gold standard of sports writing. And yeah. And, and when I say sports writing, I don't mean, I don't really mean um, going out on investigative journalism, although they did that well too, but I mean writing, I mean the craft, the actual craft of writing and putting a story together and caring about the, the, the integrity of the piece and your subject and not trying to make news necessarily mm. although you know they were good at that but but they weren't you know they weren't let's try to try to make sure that uh, everybody is paying attention to what we're doing at all times it's mm. if you appreciate a certain kind of craft then you're going to like this and so they had they had real writers right you know mm. George Plimpton and mm. John Updike and you know are writing for Sports Illustrated right um, right and but by the time I got there, they were kind of transitioning the way a lot of the media industry has transitioned and, and, and beyond that has transitioned from something where you can, this is also sort of like me in baseball and basketball, right? Something where you can sit back and appreciate the craft to something where you're just looking for clicks. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the, the, the big competitor at the time for Sports Illustrated wasn't a magazine, it was ESPN. Mm-hmm. It was instead of sitting back and reading this 5,000 word piece, those same people are going to watch Sports Center uh, and, right. and at night, and right about that time, Sports Illustrated got bought by a, you know Time Warner, which owns Sports Illustrated, got bought by AOL, mm-hmm. and that was just like the perfect encapsulation of this little new media company buying this big big company. And I felt at the time a, a shift, and the shift had already been happening, but I think it got accelerated. Of instead of being into long form journalism really prioritizing what they called modules, <clears throat> mm-hmm. right? So a box with a headline and a picture, maybe a bikini in the picture, <laughs> right. not a lot of text, you know, less than, less than 150 words of text. And, and, it, and, it, and there was no, it wasn't about like, what is this story? Why is the story important? Mm-hmm. It was, who's going who's gonna to read this? How are we going to get people mm-hmm. to read this? And that was the priority. And that wasn't what I, that's not what I, what I got. I didn't come into it to do that. Yeah. To be a salesperson. Word up. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's the world around us is mm-hmm. so much is, um, and I, I know you, you feel these pressures obviously in your career, yeah. but, yeah. but having to, having to, to turn, turning art into, into sales, um, mm-hmm. you, you sacrifice a lot. Uh, and, and I, I wanted to be able to write for myself. Word. Um, right. uh, and that, that, you know, it's, it's funny as I, as I talk about this, I see, <laughs> I'm starting to see our parallels in ways that I didn't see it before. Mm-hmm. As I see I. it too, yeah. um, especially just working with Talib on this podcast and knowing that he makes sure that we're not doing questions for clickbait or we're not trying to keep up what's popular in the blogs. Like he just wants to do a deep dive and that's it. So that's a huge way that you guys have in common. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Jamal, you're a constitutional scholar and lawyer. And Talib, you're a rapper and social media lawyer. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I litigate in public all the time. That's another <laughs> thing that me and my brother have in common. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. But anyway, what you both are black men in America who are deeply connected and concerned on focus of the matters of justice and civil rights. Um, can you both talk about how much of that came from your upbringing or where you remember ideas about justice clicking into place? You know, I, I, th I think you can't be a black man in America and not, it's not, it's not like you decide to think about justice, right? It, it's mm -hmm. just, it's just, it's just how you live your life. Um, yeah. I don't remember a time when, when that wasn't first and for, first and foremost, you're part of a community that's in the place where our community has been and has the history that our community has. And you know, all of life is about justice. All of life succeeding in, from, from where we come from is a justice question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't even know that I can, I don't even know that I could pinpoint. I mean, certainly our parents um, emphasized that and, and gave us that kind of education and background. And we're, we're, we're lucky to have, to, to be, to come from a, a family that is able to articulate that um, yes. and make it, and make it visible to us. But it's not, a, I don't, I mean, I really don't think it's a decision you make um, when you, when you come from a certain place. But I do think that the credit goes jointly to our parents and to the neighborhood, the region and the time in which we grew up. Um, mm -hmm. I think growing up in that section of Brooklyn, the Park Slope section of Brooklyn, and it's adjacent, uh, or you know, it's it's proximity to uh, Fort Greene, Bedford Stuyvesant, Clinton Hills, um, and the things that were happening culturally in Brooklyn around that time. I mean, I remember uh, our parents being part of. You talk about the National Organization of Women in your book, Jamal. Uh, at one point, um, I remember yeah. our mother being a, a part of this. I remember our parents being very active, at least on the surface, in the anti-apartheid movement uh, was mm. going on in South Africa at the time. I remember, remember that being knowing who Bishop Desmond Tutu was, and um, our friends didn't really know who that was. You know, um, I remember um, going to museums on the weekends. That was a big yep. part mm. of our our experience. Going to and being and uh, having the privilege of living walking distance of mm. the Botanical Gardens, Prospect Park, the Brooklyn Museum the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Public Library at Grand, Grand Army Plaza, spending a lot of time in that library. And our parents definitely more than the peers around us yeah. made us do those things. And so I think we developed uh, this idea that we are nothing without the community we come from. Um, right. And I think that's what, 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 how we live our lives and, and, um, or how we try to live our lives. Jamal, when when I when we were both in high school, we're, we're we're two years apart. So we were both in high school relatively around the same time. I remember, you know, I was going to boarding school, and then I came back on the weekends from boarding school, and then I went to NYU, and then I didn't go to NYU, and I left my room upstairs and moved into the basement because I wanted to feel more independent as a teenager, and I was um I was like Generation X, like I was down there watching, watching a lot of MTV, smoking a, a lot of pot, like a lot, well, all my friends would come over all the time and we would just sort of like, you know, we were going out to clubs and stuff like that and really actively participating in hip hop culture. But my friends were always super impressed with you. My friends who were largely older than me were like, yo, your brother is like a genius. And like, <laughs> like, they always describe you as you would like come to the basement and just look at us and like be like, <laughs> shake your head at us. Like you, oh, what's, what's going on in the basement? Knuckleheads. <laughs> right, right, right. So I wanted you to give your perspective of your memories of, of what it looked like to you coming down to that basement. Describe to the people who weren't <laughs> around at that time, what your perception of me as a teenager was. Well, in a, in a lot of ways, this comes back to our parents too, because you know, they knew you were smoking weed in the basement. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and, and they were like, look, he's, he's a teenager, right? He's mm -hmm. going to, he's going to smoke weed. Mm -hmm. Um, he's living in Brooklyn, you know, but, and so I'd rather him do it here mm -hmm. than do it out in the park or out on the, on the stoop, uh, where he's going to end up in jail. 
I don't know if you know this, but that's exactly what our father said to me verbatim when he finally confronted me about it, what you just said. Yeah. So, so, so I, it, it was a, you know, you changed a lot from, <laughs> from like 11 to like 14, um, where you were a lot more like me and then you were not. So, in, in, so it was some, it was culture shock in uh -huh. a lot of ways. Uh -huh. Um, and it was just like, um, it was a lifestyle I wasn't used to. Uh -huh. I, I wasn't, I, I wouldn't, I wasn't hostile or anything. No, and anything. you weren't, you weren't judgmental um, either. It yeah, no, it was just different. like, what is, you know, it's just different. Like, what is, yeah. like, what is this? Um, <laughs> right, right. I never liked the smell of weed. So, uh -huh. oh, so wow. I kind of stayed away for, for that reason. Right. I, I would, I, so when, when I was looking like you knuckleheads, I, it was probably just like, oh man, I, uh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm gonna go back upstairs. <laughs> oh, that's crazy! My um sister is 15 months older than me, and I too looked at her like you knuckleheads when she would come home smelling like <laughs> weed, and she would tell my mother the reason why she was smelling like weed because people around her were smoking weed, and I used to be in like I cannot believe you're out there smoking weed. Like, what is wrong with you? Oh, that's a classic. That's a classic excuse. <laughs> right. Yes. right. Oh, that, I, I was just, I, I was inhale. just, it was, it was just, them. yeah, oh, that ain't, I we, that's right just pine it. cones. I was in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> I was, <laughs> okay, so. But I, but I will, I will say, you know, by osmosis, mm -hmm. um, you got me to appreciate hip hop. You know, I, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I grew up a, a big fan, a big hip hop fan, but, right. but I appreciated it in a way that I definitely didn't when I was, before you got into it. Hey, that's what I'm here for, baby. It's me. It's Kweli, baby. That's what it is. <laughs> that's what I do. Um, have you gotten more into the genre of hip hop over the years? Because I know back in the day you did not listen to hip hop, but that was before Talib was actually a rapper. You know, I I don't. I feel like I don't listen to anything. I don't. I, I don't feel like I have time to do anything, get into anything other than what I do. Other, you know, my 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 family and my and my job. But I, I will. I I'm much more into music in general. Uh, much more into music appreciation in general than I was back then. And, and hip hop is definitely part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I were to say like, if you were to say like, what music do you listen to? I, I, I'm more like, what music do I not listen to? And it's a small, small group of, you know, it's a small set of things that I don't appreciate, but mm -hmm. most things I like. And I, I'll, and I want to know like, what's good in that genre. I, and I, I want to listen to it. And hip hop has evolved that way too. Right. So it's not, you know, it's not just, um, one style, uh, obviously, exactly. um, it's, right. it, it integrates a lot of stuff. And so I, I appreciate that. It's music, right? Music is music. You helped me to appreciate hip hop because like you said, hip hop, good hip hop, like really good hip hop is very intellectual. And I feel like you have a great appreciation for really good hip hop. I feel like you have a, like you just said, a great appreciation for just great music. When I come over to your house at family gatherings, you got this, you know, Sono speakers all over the house. You 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 be jamming, bro. Like it, like <laughs> I, I'm I'm legitimately impressed by your music taste and your music selection. And my take of it is okay. This is what an intelligent person likes because mm. this is this is very good music. So yeah, I appreciate your musical taste. Um, I've taught you well. <laughs> <laughs> impressive, most impressive. <laughs> um, you spoke about your family, your wife and Laura. Uh, we're so proud of her. Uh, she's a clinical professor of law at Columbia University, globally recognized advocate for asylum seekers and migrant workers. She is the director of Immigrants' Rights Clinic at Columbia. She travels to the borders, document abuse that immigrants go through firsthand. She testified in Congress before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. How has her work with refugees and immigrants shifted the way you think about the American government and our obligations to society's most vulnerable? So I don't, I don't know that I'd say it's shifted it, but it, I think it deepened it. It, it, it Laura is amazing in, in, in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. right? But one of the things that I appreciate the most about her is that she is, she is so, she doesn't, she's not part of a tribe, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's something that's really hard for, for most of us to get out of mm -hmm. uh, in all kinds, all facets of life, but including nationalistically, right? Mm -hmm. You know, she really sees the ways in which people who are not lucky enough to be born into this kind of society have every right and deserve every, um, every benefit 
that that the rest of us have. And there's no, you know, there's, right. no, there's no moral entitlement to be an American. That's right. And we can all say that, but not that many of us really deeply internalize that and what that means for our obligations towards other people. Mm-hmm. So if somebody shows up at the border, say, well, you have, you have no right to be here. Well, neither do, you know, why do I have a right to be here? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't have any more right than, than they do. Um, and so I, I, she, she checks me in that way. Mm. Right. So if, if I, so if it, I, I think about the most trivial thing, when we think about sports, where like, I root for the USA in, in the Olympics. Yeah. And she's like, why do you root for the USA? She, like, oh, she challenges you. She's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> right. right. Like they right. got the most resources they got, you know, why am I, why not? I should be rooting for, you know, for Myanmar or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, but, but, but that's just an example of, of just the way she, she just keeps, keeps, keeps me in check and makes, makes sure that I'm true to what I believe. Um, and, um, you know, she's a vegetarian. Um, I'm not a vegetarian, um, but I'm much more of a vegetarian than I used to be. You're vegetarian adjacent. I'm definitely vegetarian adjacent. Yes. Uh, and it's, and it's also from challenging me, you know, like just, um, how can you, you know, justify yourself? <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's, I'm not going to make this into a, you know, um, animal rights discussion, but it's, but it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to justify yourself. <laughs> this is going to sound really dumb, but I'm saying it anyway. Now, when vegetarians try to shame me about eating animals, <laughs> they are also two murderers because can't plants are living things. So we're both doing the same exact thing. So how can you shame me? I don't know if that argument eating? holds up. We're going to ask the lawyer in the room. Does that <laughs> argument hold up, Jamal? Well, if it, if it works for you, then that, I, I, so I'm not, I, and so I, I want to be fair to her. She doesn't shame, you know, she's not, she's not sanctimonious about, you know, she doesn't go around, you know, tisk tisking people mm-hmm. about, <laughs> about it. So, so, so that's important to her and it's important to me that yes. she not be that kind of person. Right. But, you know, if, if you, if, if, if it's the case that when you step on a plant and you step on a dog, you feel the same way, then, then that, more, that's, that's you then. <laughs> But I think most people don't feel that There's way. There's people that do. <laughs> don't, then don't eat. No, no, no. But eat. I'm saying most people don't feel that way. Don't don't <laughs> eat. Just yeah. be an be a breath breathitarian. Like just, what do you just eat. Yeah. A breathitarian? <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop me if stop me if you heard this one. Um, how do you know if someone is a vegan? How do you know? Yeah. Is this a joke? Don't worry. They'll fucking tell you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm, shout out to all my vegans out there. I agree with you, Jamal. Um, it's very hard to justify when you think about the environment and you think about our bodies and you think about we, 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 we're supposed to know better and do better. Um, but fish, fish is delicious. So I'm sorry. But um, lamb chops is good. <laughs> so, but, but Just yes. Just have me some lamb chops. The, 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 I, I will state for the record that the vegans and the vegetarians are, are, are correct. Um, you both went to South Africa together for the Malcolm X grassroots movement. I'd love to hear what you remember and um, how it better shaped your perspective. We were just, I was just talking about this with my family, actually. About this really? Because <laughs> um, they, they think that hip hop stage names are funny. So I, I was like, <laughs> yeah, we went with De- Jeru to Damaja and with, <laughs> and with Boots and with Stickman. And they're like, what? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that's like a running running joke. That's about, hilarious. Like, what's, so what's your what's your stage name? Um, <laughs> uh, that was an, that was amazing an amazing trip. I, I was just talking to someone about being chased by ostriches. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, and uh, and when we went to the tip of South Africa and um, realized that we were surrounded by bugs. <laughs> And we thought it was just the sand. We we're like, oh, that was a little bit closer. It was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, and just you know, just for you know, for me, and I, obviously, um, it's an interesting cultural experience. And South Africa is such an interesting place, kind of sociologically, given apartheid and and being not far from being post apartheid. Uh, so I, you know, I remember, um, well, so many things, um, getting lost. That was dangerous. The cab driver us. refused to refused to drive us through that was like, certain that was neighborhoods. Just, that was just you and me, right? In that cab? It might have been one other person. I remember us being lost and being in a dangerous situation. Yeah. Um, Whoa. Tell it and to stay out of cabs. I remember you pushing a white man in the street. <laughs> oh, my God. Because <laughs> he, he bumped into you. Um, I forgot about that. 
<laughs> and it was, you know, he bumped into you like, like you were not a person. Yeah. He's and you were like, about- I don't do this. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I, I'd never seen that, that side of you before, but oh. I'd also never seen anybody do that to you before though. So, right. <laughs> yeah. I remember being in a press conference <laughs> with, when, um, you got, you were all being challenged because there's people there were like, like, what do you do? You know, you're supposed to be the, 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 you know, the, pro- these progressive, um, mm-hmm. conscious artists. And you're just here singing. That's like, right. What, what are you going to do for the people? That's right. And I remember, I think it was Stickman who was <laughs> was like, you know what? If you want to, if you want to take up some arms, let's let's do it. I'm here. Right. Let's do it. I'm ret-. and I was like, I'm, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going home. If you're taking up arms, I'm going home. Uh, <laughs> Shout out to Stickman from Dead Press. Always kept the same energy, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. What I remember from that is they said, look at your jeans. Your jeans cost more than anybody makes in my township in a month. And I looked at my jeans. I was like, these are some fresh ass jeans. <laughs> 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 and we here, we here at the racism conference. I think we were in Durban. Colin Powell had, it's interesting at the time, the times that we're in now, right? Because Mm -hmm. Colin Powell walked out of that conference because they were discussing the situation with Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. And he didn't appreciate whatever was happening at the conference. So there was this extra anger against Americans. You know, like y'all just walked out of the racism conference Mm -hmm. and here y'all are, these rappers talking about we here to rap like we we out here really like dealing with abject poverty. Just got out of apartheid, like you said. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience. Um, shout out to Rosa Clemente and Martha Diaz and Dream Hampton and the Malcolm X grassroots movement and everybody who brought us down there. Uh, for me, it was the first time Jamal that you and I spent time together as adults mm. yeah. in a social setting outside of like family gatherings. Um, and so that was an important trip for me on that level. And I, I thank you for for coming on that trip. Well, thank you. You pay for it. (laughs) (laughs) So we've talked a lot about South Africa already. Have you guys both seen the movie Serafina? We saw the play. Okay. So I saw the movie and that's how I learned about apartheid. And it's funny that you talk about how you don't remember when you started, you know, wanting to fight the fight or when you started learning these things. And it starts from as a young child, because that's a movie that always has always stuck with me. And when I talk to a lot of people, they have never seen the movie or don't know anything about it. Yeah. I mean, that's part of, I remember our parents, that's part of what you're talking about. They were very active in the anti-apartheid movement. And Serafina as a play was such a big deal in the early eighties. And I remember the movie coming out and me being very happy that the movie came out. But speaking of just all this cultural black nationalism in our, in our home, um, when you went to Hunter college high school, Jamal, you wrote an essay called color me different that was published in many magazines, many newspapers across the country. Very well-written essay. People were were shocked that that you could articulate these these, these, uh, ideas about Blackness at such a young age. You were 17. Um, The essay explored why you felt treated as less than Black because you didn't fit into the stereotypes of Black teenagers at that time. Um, There's a group online, ADOS, American Descendants of Slavery, that has come after me in different ways. Um, the founder of ADOS, Yvette Carnell, tried to weaponize this essay you wrote against me, along with a pic of you playing baseball, or maybe it was softball, I don't know, with a mostly white team when you were at Yale. She was suggesting that this proves that my family does not identify as Black. Um, but your essay literally is about how the Blackness, how Blackness is not a choice. It's a part of you, regardless of what kind of music you listen to or how you dance. Um, what's your current feeling on that Black Enough conversation? So for the record, I identify as Black. (laughs) I have always identified as Black. Other people identify me as Black. And so I'm, you know, that's what, you know, that I'm in America, right? So that, that essay was, you know, Hunter, Hunter was, is not the center of Afro's, (laughs) Afro-nationalism. Certainly not. um, You know, I think there, I think in my class there, there were, so out of 200, there were 15, I think. Mm-hmm. Black students, and and today it's much much lower than that actually. Mm, wow. So I I so I I I, I that there that essay I think I was just kind of articulating being between different worlds, mm-hmm. and the world that I 
experience. And I, and I was, I was an hour, it was an hour and a half commute to Hunter. And that hour and a half was a big cultural journey to a, to a very different kind of place. Right. From, Bro- from Brooklyn, people. from a two fair zone in Brooklyn to the middle of Manhattan. To Upper like, East Side. Yeah. Right. Riding through all these different neighborhoods and right. Yeah. And I actually, right around the time I wrote that essay, I, I, I was really getting into walking a lot and I decided I was going to walk home from Hunter mm-hmm. <laughs> and took me about five hours and, and oh just we're walking through every neighborhood, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, in Brooklyn, basically. And just, I, I just, I was experiencing that, that kind of cultural journey. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that the essay was just kind of like, where, who am I? It was a, who am I essay right. um, where I'm between, I'm not part of, uh, you know, so ADOS, I'm not, par- I'm not part of that world mm-hmm. that, at Hunter, I didn't feel fully part of that world. Um, and I also didn't feel like I fit in, in mm. the, in the, in the other world. Mm. So I was still trying to find myself and figure, but it wasn't about, it wasn't about my racial identification. It was mm. just about, um, my, my comfort. Right. Understood. You also say in the essay that you can't make a layup, but then I was on Instagram and I saw footage of you hitting this deep jumper. Yeah, that was a that was a mid range <laughs> jumper. That was not a layup. <laughs> okay, okay. So you still can't hit the layup. So, so I'm only five nine. So I gotta I gotta develop my jump shot. I can't. <laughs> Tell can't it be, does not watch sports. Can't clearly. be playing with the Giants. Inside. I don't. Mm-hmm. There's a guy named Lethal Shooter who has become very famous on on social media for being guess, a lethal shooter. Mm-hmm. He's a lethal shooter, and his job is to teach people like NBA players how to get their 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 their, their how to shoot better. And uh, he's a fan of mine, and he DM me, and he's like, "Yo, I could." teach you how to be a lethal shooter. And I'm like, I'm looking at this DM and he'll probably yeah, see this. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't respond to the DM. He's going to see this. Um, I didn't respond. Cause I was like, what am I supposed to do with that? Ge- <laughs> with that generous ass offer? Like that's a yeah. real generous offer. Cause, and my son is really in, like when I showed my son, uh, uh Monty, the footage of you doing that, he was like, Oh, uncle Jamal got to like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, I'm going to introduce le- lethal shooter to my son. Cause I feel like yeah. they'll get along. He's in the basket. So that was not a, I'm not a good basketball player, but, <laughs> but there's a, there's a faculty game between NYU law school and Columbia law school uh-huh. that happens every year. And that was the, that was the winning shot of the faculty game. So I hit the ah. shot. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's no footage of the shots I missed. It's just <laughs> footage of the, of the, of the That's all shot. you need is the good That's shot. all you need. That's like right. Social just, media. just take a walk. Social media. That's right. Um, speaking of social media, you are the co-chair of the Facebook oversight board. Um, congratulations. That's a very, uh, uh, important and seemingly, uh, like hard title to have. Um, can you break down for us the thought process around oversight on Facebook and Instagram? Um, when these net, when these networks become massive portals for disseminating information, what legal obligation do they have for regulating and monitoring that information? So the oversight board comes about because Facebook is this big curator, the big, um, moderator of, of content, right? So they make a lot of content decisions on their own. Not everyone really realizes how much how much content moderation they do, right? But it's not a free-for-all on these platforms. Um, you know that very well. I, I um, absolutely do. Um, and <laughs> I know the TOS very well. <laughs> right. Uh, so Facebook has its own community standards. Um, and and they sometimes they apply them well and sometimes they don't and mm-hmm. sometimes it's and, and often it's inconsistent and facebook has also obligated itself um to abide by kind of international human rights principles mm-hmm. in the way they moderate now that can mean a lot of different things so it's it can get it can get complicated but the point of the job of the oversight board is to say it's kind of like a last appeal from mm-hmm. facebook's internal moderation <clears throat> so if they take something down or if they leave something up and you say, you say, actually, that's harmful, the thing that you're leaving up, you should take it down. If, they, if, if you disagree with their decision, you can appeal it to the oversight board. Oversight board will consider it, will um, issue an opinion for the, they'll, they'll select certain cases, issue an opinion mm-hmm. and say, um, this community standard was applied properly or not. Um, this was consistent with human rights or not consistent with human rights. And that, that decision that we make is binding on Facebook. And that you, the oversight board wasn't involved or is not responsible for the decision to re- remove Donald Trump from Facebook, right? So the over, so, so Facebook decided to indefinitely suspend Trump in January. Mm-hmm. And then they sent the oversight board the case to say, did we do the right, did we do the right thing here? And the oversight board issued a decision uh, that said, uh, you were right to suspend him at the time you did. 
but you can't have an indefinite suspension because that means that you you just have the power to do to 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 lift it or keep it without any right. standards, right? So you mm. have to either it, it can be you can either decide to make it a permanent suspension or you can make it a suspension for a certain amount of time, but it can't be like you're suspended until you're not suspended because <laughs> yeah. that's not it, that's not rule of law. You, you gotta you gotta have rules. Y'all not gonna suspend me, are you? I'm good, right? The board doesn't do the <laughs> suspending, so so the board, the board just reviews things. I don't talk so on Facebook. So if you you have an Instagram account, right? So if you if you if you decide to get yourself in trouble on Instagram, you can you can appeal the over. I'll, I'll, I'll be recused, unfortunately, but yeah, you should ah. be, you should be. But I've <laughs> I've gotten in trouble on Instagram. I feel like Instagram is very uh, inconsistent. I've made I've made Instagram post about how I feel like they're hypocritical with how they do their thing. But I also, I'm, I'm using Instagram of my own free will. And if I don't agree with the terms of service, or I think I'm being treated unfairly there, I can leave just like, yeah, hey man, corporations are people too. They can kick me out of their house. <laughs> well, so, that's what, that's what's complicated about it, about, you know, you said what their legal obligations are, right? They have their yeah. own, they have their own system. They have their own rights. They have a right to say, we're going to be a certain kind of platform and we're mm -hmm. just not going to let certain things um, go, mm -hmm. but at the same time, and this is actually a bigger problem with Facebook. It's a bigger problem outside the U.S. because Facebook has like three, almost three billion users, and the vast majority of them are outside the, the U.S. And there are countries where everyone accesses accesses the internet through Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right here right, we've right. got a lot of different competitors. We got people use the World Wide Web in, in various ways, but a lot of places Facebook is the portal. It is the internet, and so if your access to the internet, if Facebook just arbitrarily decides to boot you off then you, you just, there's a lot of stuff you don't have access to. Or if you're a business, um, especially in the U.S., um, if you're a business and that's how you make your money is, is through Facebook and they suspend your account or they, or they kick you off or they limit your ability to post, that's your bottom line, right? So mm -hmm. it does matter to people. Um, but at the same time, right, they're also, you can't, it's not like the same thing as a government where, where there's laws and the constitution and they're not bound by those things. And so mm -hmm. trying to figure part of the, part of what the board does is try to figure out, you know, how do you integrate their private rights with their power? Um, and the fact that they've committed themselves to be consistent and to, and to abide by certain principles. Mark Zuckerberg is often characterized by the press as not caring about protecting users from hate speech. Um, his statement was a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, and he reminds us that Facebook started as a digital bulletin board. And he said, I don't think that Facebook or internet platforms in general should be arbitrators in tr of truth. Where do you stand on that? And how would you describe or characterize Zuckerberg's feelings on free speech versus protecting users from hate speech? So, so there's a couple of different issues there. So one is about arbitrating truth and another mm -hmm. thing about hate speech, uh, and which I think are two separate issues. I, as to his personal feelings, I you know I don't I, I don't he he's I think the oversight board was created because I think uh, I think Zuckerberg in fact does not want to be in the position of making these decisions as a final matter, mm -hmm. um, uh, but but I, you know I don't, I don't want to get into whatever his personal views are, um, but you know hate 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 speech and misinformation is a hard problem, um, and I think I think. I think every I think a lot of people think it's not a hard problem, but they think it's not a hard problem for different reasons. And so I think people on the conservative side often think there's too much censorship. There's you know um, that censors go too far, and then on the other side, people think big exactly tech the is censoring. The big tech, yeah, yeah, yeah. is censoring right wing voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and this is a this is a problem in 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 law too. I mean, it's not just a Facebook problem. Just how do you define hate speech? If I say mm -hmm. something about a certain group. Is that hate speech? Is that is that there, there's certain is that your opinion? There's, there's some easy cases, right? If you're you know running around with swastikas and and whatnot, there's easy cases, but there's also a lot of borderline cases that are hard, and and same thing. I mean, with with misinformation, you know, we we say things that are half true all the time. Mm -hmm. I used to be a fact checker professionally. Mm -hmm. If you read a newspaper article, which the newspapers usually don't fact check, um, mm -hmm. every line will have something. And if you've if you've ever had a, a story written about yourself, um, you'll see like it's, it's oh, all yeah. wrong. it's all it's all like a little bit wrong. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I and, can I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so if you're gonna say like we're gonna take off anything that's that's false, like a yeah. you don't have the resources to do that, and b 
how do you, you know, what does that mean? Is exaggeration, you know, is that, you know, hyperbole? Is that your, well, is, is it, that your it, real hair? You know, yeah. is that false? Oh, excuse speech? me, Jamal. I wasn't talking to you, I'm I was kidding. talking to, to me. <laughs> Stop projecting, uh, Jazz. Right? <laughs> I feel triggered. Um, you know what, Jamal? I actually am a fact checker on Facebook too. It's not my job, but I do pride myself <laughs> <Voluntary> <laughs> on fact calling checker. people. I'm a voluntary fact checker. I do p- pride myself on telling people to take down their fake ass articles. I'm sorry, we haven't cursed this episode. My fault. This fake, their fake articles, especially when COVID started, it was so many people I had to either unfollow or unfriend because they were just posting a bunch of false information. <laughs> so here's a here's a here's an example of why it's hard. <clears throat> because in March of 2020, the WHO and the CDC were saying don't don't wear a mask, they don't protect you from covid. Mhm. Right? Mhm. Should they have been taken down? That's, yeah. I you know, <laughs> it, it yeah, it's hard. Um it, and and that doesn't mean you don't do anything about it, right? And so there's, you know, there's also not just misinformation, but disinformation where people are intentionally putting out things that they know are false and coordinating it. And so, mm-hmm. so there, there are, there are degrees of how bad it can get, but it's very hard. The problem of fake, you know, fake news, when all the news has some inaccuracies to it and you, figuring out people's intentions is hard, um, is a very hard problem for, for, for the platform to, 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 to do something about. Not to, that doesn't mean they shouldn't try. Right. But it's a hard problem. Well, I'm glad that you're in my family group text because you definitely, <laughs> you definitely swoop in with the hard facts. We all have family discussions about, you know, certain issues. You definitely swoop in like, well, actually, here's the facts and here's the data. Um, now, Jamal, you worked for just a judge. Is it, is it right to say Justice Stevens? Yes. Justice Stevens. Although he called himself judge often. So. Judge Stevens. <laughs> um, conservative justice, but he started, if correct me if I'm wrong, to lean a little bit more liberal progressive later in his, his career. Is that accurate? So, so I think by the time he retired, he was considered kind of just about the most progressive on the court. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's a Republican. And -hmm. I think he would have said throughout his life that he was basically a Republican, but he was a, he was a 19, you know, 1960s Republican. Right. (laughs) So the Republicans that passed the civil rights act, (laughs) a different party than, um, than the Republican Party of today. Right, right, right. Um, You wrote The Age of Scalia for the Harvard Law Review. You wrote Liberal Love for uh, Antonin Scalia for the New York Times. Um, From what what I saw, you were criticized in some liberal circles for showing what was perceived to be love to someone who was so reviled by liberals and progressives. Um, You made it clear in your essay that you basically disagree with Scalia on a number of issues, on almost damn near everything he says, but... (laughs) Um, you were able to put that aside to have admiration for the way he was able to dominate the space and his ability to get his way. Can you break down so that the backlash you've gotten for being associated with conservatives as a black man? I don't know that I would say I'm associated with conservatives that much, although I do, I do, I do make an effort to talk to people and I do make an effort to try to listen to people. Mm -hmm. And so I will do, I will do talks at the Federalist Society. Mm-hmm. And I have, I have a lot of students who are Federalist Society students. And I, and I think it's important to be part of those conversations. Mm-hmm. The, the Scalia piece, I think, th- I think that was just a case of people not getting past the headline, um, right. which of course I didn't write, right? But, right, the editor. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's, by the way, public service announcement. Like that's, if you could just get, get authors to have a say in headlines. Pet you know? peeve. <laughs> You know, um, but, on Facebook. but so it said love, right? So, oh, this guy loves Scalia. Like, oh, <laughs> right, 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 um, right, right. But if you read the piece, what the piece is about is, look, I disagree with him. I wrote, you know, my book could be dedicated to like the anti-Scalia. There's every, mm. everything in the book is, is a, is a disagreement with, with Antonin Scalia about something. Right. right? But, um, but what he was good at, and that I think that people on my side are not good at is, is communicating with people. Um, he, he, he spoke in clear language. Um, he was a good writer. Um, he was able to, to translate constitutional law to ordinary people in ways that felt intuitive to them. Mm -hmm. And that was part of why, to the degree he was successful, um, a lot of his success is owed to that. And in a lot of ways, that's what I'm trying to do with the book, right? Is, is to, 
take some complex subjects and say, where, how, where can you see yourself in this complex subject? Mm-hmm. There's a complex subject that lawyers have taken and put in a certain space. You have to go to law school. You got to study to understand these things. But wait, no, this isn't really about strict scrutiny. Well, that's mm-hmm. a law term. <laughs> this is about real people. It's about real mm-hmm. problems. And all of us have, have something to say about those real problems. And I think Scalia was actually good at that from totally the opposite side of the ideological spectrum. So that, that's what the piece was about, is just admiring the, the effort to popularize mm. what elite lawyers were doing. Mm-hmm. Because I, and recognizing that that's really important to constitutional law, uh, because constitutional law is not for lawyers, it's for everyone. That's mm-hmm. right. Um, now, speaking of headlines and titles and how people read the title, and sometimes get caught up in that. Um, the title of your book, How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. I feel like the title possibly triggers progressives because sometimes progressives like, like to think they are the sole protector of rights. Um, was that an intentional decision? And in what, what ways have progressives taken their interest in rights and turned it into a desire to quiet voices of dissent from liberal ideology? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you what the original title of the book was. Mm-hmm. Um, that title we we made we, we changed to that title in April of 2020, mm-hmm. and the original title of the book was "The Rights Epidemic," <laughs> <laughs> and it was about how how rights are everywhere and they're destructive and they're part of the human condition. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I wanted to the the kind of epidemiological connection. Mm. Um, but then the pandemic happened and I didn't want to look like a jerk. So, um, <laughs> so we changed the title. It's a good choice, but was it meant to trigger, uh, you know, I, that seems too pejorative to me. Like mm-hmm. tr- I wasn't trying to hurt people. Right. But, mm-hmm. right. but, um, but it was meant to be provocative and it was meant okay. to be, <clears throat> look, if you think you like rights, no, you like certain rights mm-hmm. <laughs> um, or you like rights when they work for you. <clears throat> but not when they don't, when mm-hmm. they work, you know, when, if someone says I have a right to go to Taco Bell without a mask, mm-hmm. you know, you, maybe, you, maybe if you're on one side of the spectrum, maybe you don't like that right. Or if someone says I have a right to um, form a corporation and spend unlimited money on, ca- on, ca- on political campaigns, mm-hmm. or I have a right or fetuses have a right to live, mm-hmm. right? That's, those are rights conversations too. And what a lot of us do is we look at that and we say, that's not really a right. <laughs> mm. And we all do that, right? So, and on the, so on the other side, they say things that we, don't, we think are rights aren't rights. <clears throat> and the, so the conversation becomes about what's a right and what isn't a right. <clears throat> and the stakes of that conversation are high, <clears throat> right? If, the, if to say the Constitution cares about some rights but doesn't care about other rights, well, if you feel very deeply about something, you say, I have a right to that. And then a judge says, no, the Constitution doesn't care about that. <clears throat> that's, that's serious. Mm-hmm. And what the book wants to say is we should stop thinking about rights as something to discriminate about, <clears throat> to say some rights exist and some rights don't, and we're going to tell judges are going to tell us what those things are, mm-hmm. and instead try to think about how do, we, how, do we, how do we construct a world in which we can mediate <clears throat> and say, yeah, you do have a right. And yeah, I have a right also. And those come into exactly. conflict. So let's figure out what to do about that conflict yeah. instead of saying one of us has a right and one of us doesn't. You know, like a, a major conflict that happens in the entertainment world every day is the rights of freedom of speech. And it's like, yes, you have the right to say whatever you want to say, but whoever you're right, working for also has the right to drop you or whoever owns this building also has the right to not book you. Absolutely. And even that kind of conflict, like I think we have a tendency to say, oh, well, he's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Facebook a little bit. It's a private company. They can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I mean, they're a private company that exercises a lot of power, right? So hold on. Maybe there are, maybe there are some things they shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but that, that that doesn't mean that you also have an absolute right to, you know, it's not about which of these rights is abs- an absolute right, <laughs> right? It's about, well, let's think about, well, who's, what are the costs here, right? How much are you burdened by what someone is doing? <clears throat> are there alternatives that work for both of you, right? So the book is trying to work through how do you approach all the, all the rights conflicts we have in society in ways that, um, that mediate <clears throat> instead of, instead of choosing, or I, I call it rightsism, <clears throat> Discriminating right. mm-hmm. between one right and another right. Um, I actually, 
that whole thing that Jasmine just brought up about freedom of speech. Um, I wrote an essay called Free Speech or Die. Have you read, read this essay, Jamal? Uh, I don't remember. So I'm going to send it to you. Um, this guy in Portland, I was, I was, uh, wrote it because of this guy in Portland. This guy who um, was on a train and saw a Muslim girl wearing a hijab and he starts harassing her. And these two veterans say, hey, you can't harass this woman. Yeah, I remember and, that episode. Mm -hmm. And he stabbed both of them to death, right? This was a guy that a week before he did that, he was in Portland. And you know, Portland is a hotbed of like neo-Nazi activity, proud boy activity, um, you know, white supremacist organizations. Um, they hide under the premise of we're fighting for free, free speech. This guy was at a free speech rally, right? And he's waving a Nazi flag. And he's like, free speech. And what was interesting to me is when he killed those men, he yelled out, you are trying to infringe on my free speech. So he felt like I have the right to murder these people. I have the right to, to physically kill them because they won't let me harass this Muslim woman. When they brought him into court, he yelled out, free speech. Right? And so that's what made me write that essay because I said, People often confuse freedom of speech with freedom from consequences. Exactly. Or people think people think that because they have freedom of speech, you know, when I when I do argue with people all the time, they say, Well, Talib, you are stopping my free freedom of speech. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not, I don't have the power to stop you from saying what you want to say. I also have freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. I just choose to use my freedom of speech to oppose uh, you know, your ideas. Um, so with that said, do you think colleges, I've heard you speak about the college thing. Do you think colleges are worried too much about protecting students from ideas that might be uncomfortable to them? No, um, not in general. Mm -hmm. I think there are instances where that happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I will, I'll be the first person to say I teach students. I think that students are too sensitive. <clears throat> I'm happy mm -hmm. to say that. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm, that doesn't have anything to do with rights. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the I think what we often do is we we look at at things happening on campuses, for example, and we say, oh, it's this cancel culture, mm -hmm. and and people have a people have a right to harass people and mm -hmm. and tell them uncomfortable. I don't think people, you know, colleges can choose how to structure their education. Mm -hmm. Exactly, they're a certain kind of institution, and you know, you can vote with your feet there too, right? If you don't want to go to a certain kind of school, you don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody's forcing you to sit in the college classroom and, and, and colleges do have a responsibility to their students. Right. And so there's a, there's an episode in the book and there's a whole, whole chapter really on campus speech, but there's an episode in the, in that chapter about uh, Auburn university uh, and some guy, someone who, who was a booker for Richard Spencer, who's this white nationalist. Yeah. He used to troll me on Twitter. Guy. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure he loves you. Um, and, and, and the feeling is mutual. And he, he booked his booker books him at Auburn University. Auburn's a public university. Mm -hmm. And Auburn um, gets they get their students protest. He's, this guy is a is a, a neo-Nazi. And um, the, the school says, oh, OK, we, and, we, and they withdraw his invitation. They say you can't. And he sues. The booker sues. Booker mm -hmm. is not at the school. He doesn't even live in the state. <laughs> he sues neither in Auburn. Richard Spencer is not has no special connection to Auburn University. The Booker sues and he wins. <laughs> and they say you can't you can't engage in view what what the law calls viewpoint discrimination mm. because you're a public university. So you know if you if this person had been like an egalitarian, <laughs> you wouldn't have kicked him off campus because racists objected to that. <laughs> Right. right, you would you would have said no. Of course, you can speak. Shut up to to mm -hmm. the and so you, and so the, what the court says is public university can't engage in viewpoint discrimination. This is exactly the the wrong kind of way to approach this kind of question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can the police engage in viewpoint discrimination? No, <laughs> right. So police can't go arrest him because they don't like the things he's saying. But can a university make a decision <laughs> about who to invite onto its campus when it has students on its campus, mm -hmm. black and brown students on mm -hmm. its campus? Who can, does it have to, it has to tolerate someone who's going to stand up and insult them right. and abuse them? I mean, that's, that's, that's absurd. Yeah. And what it comes from is this view that we've got to, every conflict's got to be boiled down to, oh, this is free speech. 
or this is not free speech. Instead of saying, well, what, what are the interests at stake here? Mm. What is the university trying to accomplish? Is that something that universities get to try to accomplish? Are they doing it in a ham-handed way? Are they do going too far? If he went across the street to the park <laughs> and gave the same speech, it would be fine. That's There's right. no, no one would stop him from doing that, right? So, so I, I, think, I think campuses are just an example of one of, the, one of a lot of spaces where there, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a complex situation. There are speech interests at stake. There also are the university's speech interests are at stake. And the care that they have to show to the students on their campus are at stake. And same same thing with lots of, you know, in, in the '80s there was a big debate about um, what was called the speech code movement, mm -hmm. um, where where schools would say, you know, you're not allowed to harass people on the basis of race or sex. And this was happening as there were a lot more minority students were were entering colleges, mm -hmm. and people were there were racists on campus saying all kinds of things, and the, the schools started having Rules that said you can't you can't do that <laughs> to your fellow students, and people sued and they often won mm. because speech is speech is speech is speech is speech, right? Rather than saying, well, yeah, speech is important, but so is keeping students free from harassment, right? They have a right to go to that school also. <laughs> yeah, and so let's let's think about this in a more textured way. Word up. Uh, I actually my minor was pre law and. That particular case that you were just talking about, I would love to like talk about that in class because as I'm listening to you, I'm like, yeah, they shouldn't have to um, pay the booker. But then when I'm thinking on it from the other side, devil's advocate or whatever, is it the booker's fault that the school did not do their due diligence and find out that they were inviting a racist prick to speak at their school? No, it's not his fault. And so if they... Um I mean, he knew he knew who he was booking for, right? He didn't know um, who but, he was booking for, but the school should have but, known who they yeah, were no, booking. No, I, I agree. So if if let's say he spent some money, he get, he bought a plane ticket for Richard Spencer after mm -hmm. they said he could come, and then he sued the school and said, "You got to pay my plane ticket." That's, yeah, I I think he's right about yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Right, yeah. but that because that was his reliance on them. Exactly. But that doesn't give him a right to talk at the school. Right. No, like, they still have a you know I, so. Um, we can we can get in we can be nuanced enough to make those distinctions, yeah. right? Um, you said, and I love this line that in striving to take rights too seriously, we take rights too literally. Can you break down what that means to you, and um, what do you think an average citizen should view their relationship with rights? Well, what I, what I meant by literally is we think that just the fact that you say I have a right means you get to do whatever the right protects. So if I have a right to free speech, I get to speak wherever I want in any situation with for any institution. If I have a right to bear arms, I you know, I can carry my gun wherever I want. And instead of saying look, I can say that your right to bear arms mean doesn't mean you get to take your your gun to a school or an airport. Mhm. Mm Without saying that you don't have a right to bear, I can cons I can say I can still say, look, I respect that you have a right to bear arms, but you must also respect that there you live in a society, <laughs> and people in society also have rights, and those rights right. will come are going to conflict with your right to 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 look threat walk around with 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 deadly weapons. Yeah. So so let's stop talking about whether you have a right to bear arms. That does, that doesn't get us anywhere. <laughs> right. Let's start talking about well, what does that mean? How far does that go? And that's actually really important to, to protecting rights, because if you, and you, you see this time and again in courts, if you think that rights are going to be kind of absolute, then you're not going to think there's a lot of rights, because you can't think there's a lot of rights. Mm -hmm. And so the Supreme Court has rejected a right to education, mm -hmm. because, in, and they said explicitly, mm -hmm. a right to equal education, in a, school, a case out of San Antonio where there were you know, the, because of property taxes, the rich kids had a much better school than the poor kids, mm -hmm. even though they're all public schools in the same district. And the court said, well, we do, you don't have a right to educate. That would mean you have a right. That, be, that would mean that you have a right to, you must have a right to food or a right to shelter. You must have a right to, we'd have to equalize police right. services and, and, and turn, turn us into a socialist, you know, communist. So if you think that that's the consequence of rights is that you go all the way, then you're going to, you're going to take that as a reason to say, actually, that's not a right. Yeah. And so then you end up having judges picking and choosing which rights they th they feel comfortable protecting. Yeah. I like that you called uh, some of Wayne LaPierre's words from the NRA rubbish 
in your book. That's not, a, you know, your book was, was very academic. And so I'm reading it and I'm, I came across that. I'm like, yeah, that is rubbish. Thank you for calling what it, what it is. Sometimes you, sometimes you just can't, just can't hold your tongue. You yeah, just, it's just mm-hmm. rubbish. Just rubbish uh, just, just slips out. <laughs> <laughs> I know this um, is a family program, but, you know. <laughs> um, your book also talks a lot about uh, voting rights for good reason. Um, I, you want on your friend Jeff Perlman's podcast, you gave an analogy about Mars is attacking. When you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, voter disenfranchisement and how people view it. Do, can you revisit that analogy for us? Oh, so what I, so it was about vote fraud. Yeah. And a, a lot of people who are trying to um, curtail voting rights say they're doing it in the name of vote for, voter fraud. They say it's a, you know, it's a real, it can be a real problem. And this is part of the book, but also just part of the general point about the conversation around voting rights, right? When, when you've got important rights at stake and you're going to curtail them, you have to have good reasons. And those reasons should be grounded in some evidence. And there is not a lot of evidence of in-person voter fraud at any, at, in, 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 with, of any significance. And so I analogize that to, yeah, in theory, you know, we could be attacked by Martians tomorrow. <clears throat> Like, I can't tell you that that's not going to happen, but it's very unlikely. And so if I'm going <laughs> to curtail though? your rights, I can't curtail your rights on the basis of something that's totally unlikely. <clears throat> Say, well, mm-hmm. actually, we're, we're going to make sure that you need to use, you know, you need three, three forms of ID before you vote, because otherwise the Martians are going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> like may, maybe, but probably not, <laughs> right? So maybe you shouldn't have that requirement because voting is pretty important, and voter fraud right. is like that. It's like, yeah, theoretically, someone could could say, "Okay, I'm going to go vote for this person who's not me." That's a theoretical possibility, but there's no evidence that people do that very much. In fact, there's good reason to think people aren't going to do that very much because. All you get out of that is one extra vote and well, how many elections turn on one vote and what you, and if someone finds out you're going to prison for a long time. Right. 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 So, you know, what, why, why are we worried about this problem? And if, if it looks like we don't have good reason to be worried about this problem, then I get mm-hmm. suspicious that actually you're thinking about something else. Right. 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 And keeping certain um, people from voting. No doubt. That's exactly right. Um, you also said something in the book that I found interesting. We were talking about Harlan, the first Harlan. and um, you said uh, centrist Republicans are an endangered species. Um, I thought about this when you were talking about just, uh, Justice Stevens. You said he's not the type of Republican that we know Republicans to be today. He comes from a different era. And correct me if I'm wrong, but he comes from the era of Republicans before uh, Southern strategy, right? So can you give us a legal, concise breakdown of what Southern strategy is? Because what happens a lot online is People say, well, you know, the Democrats started the KKK and the Democrats mm-hmm. were the party that was trying to stop, uh, you know, uh, were trying to make sure that slavery, slavery. remained an institution. Um, and people forget that, well, it's the Republicans who are marching to save Confederate statues in this era. And, you know, so can you give us a sort of the legal breakdown of a lot? And when you push back with this other strategy argument, a lot of people say, well, that's just liberal propaganda. So that's why I wanted to give you a chance to speak. <clears throat> well, there's no, there's no question that the Democratic Party used to be the, the defenders of slavery and the defenders of Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. And the Republican Party, and, it, and there's been a, a switch in, um, in the valence of the, of the political parties. Mm-hmm. For the historical story on this, I, I recommend people read Kevin Cruz, um, who's a historian at Princeton who's written a lot about, about, great, great historian. about this. Um, and, and there's and there are a lot of people who've written about this. The the biggest driver of the of this change was the Great Migration. Mm. Uh, so, where in you know or turn of the century, early ni- early 1900s, 90 percent of the black population in the U.S. lived in the South, mm. and by the 1970s, that was like 40 percent. And and moving from a place where they didn't where they were not able to vote <laughs> to a place where they were, right? And so you have a massive population shift into cities. Of people, uh, and so that that re- that ends up reorienting the parties, and it's a it's a complicated story. But 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 FDR's coalition um, ends up being a lot of rural whites and a lot of urban um, 
some whites, but also also African Americans um, in the 1930s, and and he dominates politics, uh, and so that that ends up being a reorientation where a lot of black black people who were old, who were Republicans in the South move north and become Democrats. But that because of Jim Crow, that alliance can't hold. <clears throat> Alliance of you know, black Democrats and, and white Dixiecrats in the South can't hold. Mm. And so gradually, and then accelerated by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, white, uh, white Democrats in the South become Republicans. And they're, mm. they, they don't change their politics. They just change their party identification. And then there's an explicit strategy in the 1970s to um, peel off Catholics in particular from the Democratic coalition, mm -hmm. and that's that's the the fight over abortion rights and the fight over mm -hmm. gay rights. Same, you know, gay gay rights is um, the moral majority is part of that to try to to try to peel off Catholics and evangelicals from the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, people who supported Kennedy um, end up being Repub Reagan you know, Reagan Democrats in the nineteen excuse me Reagan supporters or Republicans in the nineteen eighties. So the, the parties end up shifting without. It's not because um, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's not that, that the Democrats, you know, or they're not, it's, it's a label, it's a party label, um, mm -hmm. just like Republican is a party label. And those things change, have changed since then. Yeah. So at the moment, it seems as though, and we just got good demonstration of this with Liz Cheney, that the Republican party is the party of Trump right now. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll right. see what, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. And I think it's also important to note, um, particularly for black people who are critical of the Democratic Party, it's, I think it's also fair to say that the Democratic Party in many ways takes the black vote for granted and takes for granted that black people in this era are going to be supportive of Democrats, um, which is, a, is, a, is I think, is a, a valid uh, criti criticism that we have to add to this conversation when we, when we say, well, there was a switch, right? Yeah, well, we yeah. have a very crude political system mm -hmm. um, because we have two major parties and we're only we're always going to have two major parties and only two major parties unless we change the way we vote for, for, for things. Um, mm -hmm. and this gets, this, there's, this is a political science conversation, right? But mm -hmm. our voting structure leads us to having two stable political parties. And so those parties have to have, have to represent people who disagree with each other about a lot of things. Yeah. And ends up, yeah. so what is your alternative? If you're a black voter, you're going to vote for the for Republican party. Um, right. Yeah. So that's going to happen. Um, and I, 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 and lots of other people um, have advocated ways of breaking that up. New York City right now is going through a mayoral primary where they have instant runoff voting, mm -hmm. which is one of the ways to 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 help with that, so that you don't have spoilers in elections. Mm -hmm. um, so that if somebody runs as the, I'm going to, you know, if in 1984 if Jesse Jackson shows up and says I'm going to run as an independent candidate, let's say mm -hmm. that that doesn't threaten. If you had instant runoff voting, that would not threaten. Walter Mondale, those votes would end up getting pooled uh, at the at the end of the day. So there there are things you can do mm -hmm. to prevent to to give some more voice to to people who are who might be on the margins of a political party. But mm -hmm. our, our 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 system is not structured to do that right now. I like that you provided yeah. solution for it because um, a lot of people complain, particularly in a presidential election year, um, that they don't like. Uh, money in politics. They don't like the electoral college. They don't like the two-party system. And then I, what I say to people often is, okay, but what are you doing in between those four years exactly. to change that system? If you, you know, so I like the fact that you are providing paths for people who, who want to maybe change, try to change that system. Right. My, um, my cousin seems to pull me into a Republican versus Democratic conversation. No matter what we're talking about, she'll find her way to ease into that. And yesterday we were just having the same debate because she always says, oh, you know, the, um, the Republicans are the ones that wanted to end slavery. And I'm like, yeah, but how long ago was that? <laughs> and what you were just discussing, Jamal, it's, I'm a Democrat, but there are small pieces of Republican Party that I do like, but it's like, overall, I would have to say with Democrat because I don't agree with majority of what Republicans are doing. And if there was a way that I could just get that little bit of peace and like merge it into something. It well, would you have to be independent, right? Because I, like, I, I vote as an independent, but I largely align with progressives, which are largely in the Democratic tent. It's, so it's, you're forced... You're forced to vote Democrat if exactly. you're a progressive 
which feels unfair. It fe- it definitely feels unfair. It's literally it's still the lesser of two evils, but I'm also an advocate of what are we doing in between to change it cuz it's like every year right before the election they're like for for sure this time they're like, "Oh, the Democrats do not just deserve our vote. We need to make them work for it." And it's like, "Yeah, the elections in 4 months and we don't want Trump as president. So what are we about <laughs> to make them work for?" Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a structural problem. <laughs> It's you know we have primary elections and and um, that creates a structural problem. There's a, there's some differences between how we should think about at least how I think we should think about this problem in a legislative setting versus a versus an executive or a single a single member office, right? So, um, you know if if we want to have representation for certain viewpoints, the way the best way to do that is is to have a legislative process that allows as in many other countries for um for smaller parties to have some um representation. And the, the only way for that to work, either you have a, a, a explicitly have a proportional system so that you give some votes to people who if you get 10% of the votes, you get 10% of the seats, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you put in place systems like instant runoff voting that uh, make it possible for more progressive candidates to win mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. districts. Uh, yes. For people who aren't who aren't part of the same political party structure, to win in districts and but and at the executive level, I don't, you know I think executives should be should be more or less consensus candidates. I mean that's my own view. Like I don't think they should be radically to one side or the other. I think the mm-hmm. legislature should have representation from the whole spectrum, but mm-hmm. but for mm-hmm. the executive that has to represent everybody, right? So, so I I think there should be incentives in place that that push that person towards the center. Okay, so in your book, you quote W.E.B. Du Bois, a uh, famous quote, uh, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. You refer to America's race problem as America's original sin many times in the book. You also wrote, and I love this, white supremacy was a constitutional promise to slave owners. I personally feel like your book is about the legality of the Black experience and attempts to explain how our legal system is built around protecting a white supremacist status quo. How has that negatively impacted our legal system? <laughs> um, I mean, th- th- you're right that that's an essential ingredient mm-hmm. of the U.S. founding. Mm-hmm. I-, I think the book the book is about pluralism. Mm-hmm. If I had to say it like one in one word, the book okay. is about the fact that in a society you have people coming from all different places with all different kinds of commitments and all different kinds of values. And you've got to figure out a way of building a rights culture Mm -hmm. that responds to all of those people Mm -hmm. and not just some of those people. The founding built a rights culture that I actually think there's a lot of good to be said about Mm -hmm. because one of the things that they understood is that rights exist within communities and that what you're trying to do with rights is build a community that itself protects rights. Mm -hmm. Rights are not about going to some judge and having them declare your rights. Rights are about building a society that protects everyone's rights. And the way you do that is to, is, is politics. Mm -hmm. You do that through negotiation. You do that through local political institutions, Mm -hmm. but they're, of course, their major, their fatal problem for them was that they didn't include people. Mm -hmm. So they were like, we're going to build this wonderful self-governing community, local communities, but just for us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to terrorize and abuse people who are not part of our community. Mm-hmm. But the idea that that's where rights comes from, that rights comes from communities and not it's not about, that doesn't come from judges, is an insight that I think is worth recovering. But the, the point is to try to integrate that into a genuinely pluralistic society, a society mm-hmm. where you actually care about people you actually invite them into the conversation and we we still have we still have not gotten there mm-hmm. right the book is not nostalgic mm-hmm. right we still have not gotten to the point where we we understand rights in a constructive and productive way but mm-hmm. also in a way that includes people in a serious way yeah and so that that fundamentally that's what the book is about is about including people and that's that's what the founders didn't get but that's also what our modern rights culture also doesn't get that fully because we think that in order to, to declare rights, you've got to pick and choose mm-hmm. between who, whose rights count and whose rights don't. That's It's so weird because I'm working on my new album with Mad Lib called Liberation. And I started it in 2011 and I was listening to a song. 
I wrote back then called Moral High Ground. And the hook is, for you to stand up, somebody got to lie down. So you're like, fuck the moral high ground. And that's essentially, like, encapsulates what you're saying, right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much for your time. This has been so wonderful. Um, I love you. I respect you. I'm inspired by you. I admire you. Um, and I just have one more question before we let you go. Um, and this question is sort of about radicalism. You've described our politics as brothers is very similar, but I'm more radical um, than you are in the way I present my, my politics. And I have more radical association. I mean, you said you were hanging out with me at the racism conference in, in Durban, South Africa. And stick man was like, if y'all ready to take up arms and you're like, ah, oh, that's a little bit too radical for me. You know, <laughs> that's more where, you know, where I'm rolling. So talking about the Capitol riots, which to me was awful. And to me was a referendum on American politics and it wasn't shocking to me at all. I felt like I'd been banging that drum in, in the flesh. I went to the White House to protest against the Trump administration in the streets for a week in 2017. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of t my time on social media being like, y'all need to pay attention to, this, to what's happening here with these MAGA people. Like, they're not fucking around. Like, they could potentially get violent. On my podcast, Midnight Miracle, uh, myself, Yassine Bey, and Dave Chappelle, we called you and we spoke about this. I don't know when that's going to be on the podcast, but we asked you about this. Uh, living in a country founded on, revo on revolution and revolt and being a Black man who has seen the power of well-aimed protests, what is your legal take on what happened at the Capitol riots? And could you ever imagine a coup or revolt at the Capitol building that you would agree with? Part of the book is that we actually have to make judgments. We have mm -hmm. to actually make political judgments about when things are right and when things are wrong. Mm -hmm. Saying you may never protest mm -hmm. or that protest may never be violent. I think I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think there are times when that makes sense. I, I think transparently the capital riots did not involve that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, but that is, that is, that is politics though, right? Deciding what is inbounds and what isn't inbounds is part of political conversation. And those of us who think that, who think that was plainly out of bounds have to say so. Very easy to, so ima imagine they won. <clears throat> Right. So imagine That's Congress like, yeah. said, yeah, you voted for Biden. Right. But Trump says that there is fraud. And so and so therefore we're going to we're going to keep him as president. And then people roll up on the Capitol and say, nope. <laughs> Am I going to say that they shouldn't do that? No. I mean, that's that's the history of the world. Right. And so um, and, and America is not immune from it. <clears throat> and so th this is why it's important for us to to, to not. Um, create these silos where people have these fantasies arise, where they say, anytime we think we're aggrieved, we've got to, it's got to be pedal to the metal. No, you're not aggrieved. <laughs> um, and we, we have to be able, we have to be able to have that conversation. So, so no, I don't, you know, I, I think that there are times when it's important to be radical. Obviously those people in the Capitol thought they were right, <laughs> mm -hmm. but the rest of us thought they were wrong, including the people in the bill, you know, including the people who were casting those votes mm -hmm. against certification of the election. They knew, mm -hmm. they knew that what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so that is a very different circumstance than they're actually being honest patriots. They were gaslighting, mm -hmm. right? And, and you have to call them out, right? And, and that's what, you know, that's what political conversation is about and political discourse is about, is about, um, is about saying, no, you've, you've got to, what's your evidence? You've got to produce something. <laughs> we're not just going to have a, con we're, not, we're not just going to proceed as if, you know, anytime your side or my side just asserts something that everyone's just got to line up behind it. We have to build a different kind of culture. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Powerful words from a powerful man. Um, thank you for your time. I'm so glad that People's Party led us to have this type of discussion that we might have at like say the Thanksgiving table. Yeah, we came a long way from, you know, action figures in the back of the Volkswagen Beetle. No Aww. doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party is proud to have Jamal Green. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.